everybody. I'm Levi Litvai, and I am here to talk to Bramsberg, a uh, good colleague from Team Populism, and uh, we are going to talk about a very important and very interesting, and uh, personally, I really like this paper. It was published in Government and Opposition. It's titled Populism, Persistent Republicanism and Declinism, an Empirical Analysis of Populism as a Thin Ideology, and this is with the co-author Mark uh, Eklardus. I, I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, welcome, say hi to everybody. <laughs> Hi everybody, and 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 thanks for having me. Uh, I also want to congratulate you, Levy, uh, with this uh, nice initiative. Uh, I think uh, that your students must be grateful for uh, for having this this way of discussing papers. Uh, well, hopefully the whole world, because we're making them available to uh, to everybody over the Team Populism YouTube channel. So, uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you. So. Um, so, okay, so about your paper. So tell us a little bit about it. Where, where did this come from? Where did you get this idea of, uh, of uh, writing this paper? Well, um, maybe I, I can also introduce me a little bit and, and together with mm -hmm. my co-author to just give you a kind of background. Eh? Um, uh, Mark Elkardus uh, was first author, he's, he's a cultural sociologist, um, and he was also the supervisor of my PhD. Um, I am also a sociologist, so I think it's important that uh, when people start reading the paper that they, that they keep in mind that it's written by a sociologist who basically aim to, let's say, achieve a better understanding of the core mechanisms that generate a substantial demand for populism. We are, we are and we were not interested in, in predicting short-term variation in, in voting preferences. Our starting idea was basically that no matter how important the supply side of politics is, we, we don't want to downplay that element. We, we know that the way politicians and political parties talk about uh, uh, public issues is important for public opinion. But uh, in any case, any type of political party, including populist parties, will not be successful if there is no, let's say, latent demand. And, and what we wanted to understand is that, that latent demand. Right? We want to understand why populist attitudes are so appealing for so many people and, and, and for whom in, in, in particular, actually. Eh? Um, and when you look from that perspective to populism, I think that there are two important insights that we borrowed from the literature and that actually greatly influenced our view, our thinking and our work about populism. And, if you allow me, I, I would like to briefly Absolutely. discuss the, the, these two elements because I think they are very important for this paper, but also for all the rest that we have written uh, so far. First of all, there is Paul Taggart's notion of a heartland. And actually, I don't know whether it was Paul's original idea or, or that he borrowed it from somewhere else, but we read it in his work and, 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 and we think that that's a very important notion, eh? that idea that populism almost always promises a return to what he called a heartland, eh? a retrospective, historical, diffuse, but very romanticized construction of, let's say, an ideal world. Eh? Um, and I think that that, that is really important. Eh? That, that notion of a heartland has several characteristics which partly explain the appealing characteristics of populism. First of all, it refers more to a feeling than a well-taught idea. Uh, second, it is very broad. Uh, the, that notion of a heartland, that idea that we should take back control, that we make our country great again is, is, is very broad. So people can have many reasons for claiming that society is in decline eh? um, uh, and it, it can be all be put under that same umbrella. Eh? We, we think that one of the core characteristics of populism is that it um, 
is, is able to unite very different grievances. Eh? Another reason why that notion of heartland is, is important is that it, it gives people a, a horizon. Eh? And, and by doing so, a kind of sense of control, actually. Um, it is that element, and I think that we will discuss that later on, which ultimately gives populism the potential to become a politics of, of, of hope. Eh? So, so the notion of heartland was is, is one very important element. And then a second actually uh, let me let me stop you right there. I you know, I mean you mentioned that you saw this in Paul Taggart's work, but yeah. Heartland to me, who lived in Nebraska for 12 years, is 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 like the most positive way of referring to Nebraska. It it's 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 in the common language. Yeah, you know, in, in, in American English at least. And it's 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 what the people on the coast uh, call uh, with the derogatory term a flyover country and and the values and everything about that place. And uh, and Heartland is what, what the people over there are calling it, the country music, the the the, the old fashioned way of life. So so to me it's very common normal everyday use language even. So so what and what you're describing is perfectly fitting all that <laughs> yeah yeah so, yeah so so the idea is that when you hear polit a populist talk about the world they want to build that it's often um a lost past a past which actually may not have existed at all eh? which, which is romanticized and and which is projected as a future and and in that way it's very much linked to what we would say modernization nostalgia. I think there are also a couple of interesting uh, uh, papers which uh, have, have shown that nostalgic feelings are very much uh, related to, to, to populist uh, uh, attitudes at all. So I think that that notion of we can go to a better world that we once have is, is, is a crucial mobilizing element in in populism because it makes things concrete it, it, it provides a horizon and at the same time provides a kind of sense of uh, 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 control is, is is that an answer to your question oh yeah abs absolutely i mean it just just yeah. the background of it so yeah. so then, um then i have a, a okay second. so 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 this is the notion that you're you're working around you said that there's a second something a second but, uh, yeah a second element that is laclau's idea about the 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 use of empty signifiers eh? and more specifically uh, the idea that um in populism the category is the people and the elite that they have actually no specific intrinsic meaning eh? um their meaning is completely defined by their antagonistic relationship eh? in in populism the people is everything what the elite is not and and vice versa eh? and you can link that also to the work of margaret kenovet who um Kenovan, who actually shows that um once a, a populist politician speaks to different audiences that then the specific meaning of categories like the people and and the elite actually vary in terms of uh, in function of the specific audience to which he, 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 he speaks. Eh? So the categories like the people and, and the elite are umbrella terms with no fixed intrinsic meaning, but a meaning that is fully determined in relational terms. And I think that that is really crucial to understand two appealing characteristics of populism eh? uh, or that two appealing characteristics follow directly from from that eh? the first is that the fact that, that the, ca the the category the people is presented in a positive and very broad way makes it very appealing for those groups that face difficulties in finding a positive social identity eh? um, the rise of a more merit-based society the decline of let's say traditional labor class politics labor class movements they have generated a society where many people find it very difficult to to find a positive social identity eh? and precisely because the notion of the people is always positive is also uh, quite flexible it enables people with a very different background 
and also who are worried for very different reasons to identify with that category. So in a sense, um, populism succeeds there where traditional parties actually fail, that is by bringing together different grievances, different backgrounds uh, 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 behind uh, a polit populist politician. And of course, the fact that the, the meaning of these categories, the people and the elite is defined in relation in terms, also implies that populism helps to define enemies. Uh, um, uh, populism is, for me, one of those conflict discourses that, that help people who feel for whatever reason vulnerable to attribute that vulnerability to a group conflict and in this way safeguard their own self-esteem. Hey, when you can say my problems result from a group conflict where people like me are betrayed by other people, including the politicians, your responsibility in these problems automatically decreases. Hey? So these are just the two elements that are central in our work, also in, in, in this paper, but also in, in, in the papers that we have uh, uh, published uh, late, later on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is interesting. So you're, you're coming at it, at it from like a sociological point of view. Yeah. You're, you're thinking about this from, uh, from a side where, I mean, both people at this time, when you wrote this paper, I mean, we were looking at what, I think it's 2016 is the citation, but it was already online in 2014. So they, they, they had a backlog. So that means that you wrote this paper in 20. 11, 12 ish, uh, knowing how long a review process takes. So, so, uh, so, so 10 years ago, people were not thinking about populism from this perspective, from a sociological perspective, from the perspective of the people. But in, in political science, populism was the elite phenomenon, and only very few people started thinking about uh, tapping this as public opinion and as public or uh, people sentiments. So, so, so this was certainly new. Um, yeah, you're, you're completely yeah. right. Eh? The, this paper in a way is quite old. Eh? It was assigned to an issue in 2016. It was published uh, online in, in 2014, but you're right. We started working on, on it in 2011 when we were in fact, ask to contribute to a special issue of a Dutch journal. These guys ask me and, and, and other people, uh, we want to do something about populism. Do you have data for, for that? And can you write a piece about that? And then uh, I, I, I went to the databases that we gather uh, at our uh, research group, and I found something that more or less looked as a, a populism uh, uh, scale. And, and, and we start working on that. And so let's say a first draft was, was published in, in 2012 in a Dutch journal. It, it had a somewhat uh, different uh, topic and, and different entry points. Later on, we start working on that and, and, and to translate it to, to an English version, did other analysis and, and these kind of things. So, so it, it is quite an old uh, 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 paper in one sense, because when we started writing the paper, there were, I think, one or two papers that focused on, on populist attitudes. Eh? So one thing that we want to make uh, very clear with this paper is that, A, it, it is important that you study also the demand side of politics. Eh? Um, it's, it's, it's very clear that the supply side is important. You can do a lot of uh, uh, with, 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 with research on, on political concepts, on uh, political parties, party behavior. But at a certain moment, if you want to understand a phenomenon as populism, you have to see where, you have to assess where that latent demand for populism actually comes from and how it works. Eh? And then a second starting point, let's say, is that when you want to understand that demand side, it is probably best to study populist attitudes and not so much voting preferences. Eh? Because precisely when you say um, populism is in, 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 in reality almost always combined with more substantive, uh, substantive uh, uh, claims, 
Then, of course, um, measuring voting preferences um, mixes things that you want to separate it. So we, we thought precisely because there is no populism in a pure form, uh, we cannot work with vote choices. Eh? We have to work with a scale which tries to, to, to tap into um, uh, the populist attitudes uh, uh, itself, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just trying to think of all the findings since this paper on, on populist attitudes. And yeah, sure, populist attitudes do predict the voting behavior. But uh, one of the striking findings is that populist attitudes are incredibly high in all societies that where it's been looked at. At least uh, if it's operationalized through means that, uh, well, not specifically your questions, but but these kinds of means that, that the support for these ideas are generally very high. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if they met, not all of that support manifests in a vote. Yeah. In fact, in some countries, it can't manifest in a vote because there's no supply, though uh, a decreasing set of countries, <laughs> almost none at this point, uh, I would say. But, uh, but definitely doesn't translate into, into, into the vote. But, but, you know, I mean, what, what you're saying is music to my ears because yeah, I'm but, also fully on board with, yeah. I, I want to study attitudes. I, wanna, I don't want to, I don't want to study voting behavior. I want to study attitudes. Yeah. I want to understand what makes people think, tick, et cetera. So, so we're totally on the same page. What, what I wanted to say uh, on, on, on that argument that populist attitudes are, are always quite high when you, when you measure them in, in surveys, I think there are two elements important. Eh? From, a, from a technical point of view, that is clearly a problem. Eh? One of the problems of most of these populist scale is that they are probably not good in distinguishing the, 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 the very high uh, levels from from the normal high levels eh? because you 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 get ceiling effects in 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 your measurement eh? um, so from a technical point of view that may become a problem eh? you would like to uh, to to have items which has a more like a normal distribution eh? that is not too much skewed but from a more theoretical point or a more substantive point of view um, uh, I would say, well, first, uh, that populist attitudes are much more higher than populist votes. That is a simple consequence of the fact that if people have to uh, choose for a party, they not only choose for populism, they also choose for the more substantive ideology that is present or the more substantive points that are present. So it's, it per makes perfectly sense that your populist attitudes are much more prevalent when compared to, to your populist uh, uh, vote. And then a second point is one of the reason, reasons why uh, uh, populist attitudes are supported by such a large segment of the population is of course a direct effect of the people centrism uh, element, eh? precisely because populists always present them as the true Democrats and precisely because most people uh, um, uh, strongly identify and support democracy, um, it makes sense that when you formulate items where an anti-establishment attitude is combined with, let's say, a, a, a represented pure democratic view on, on, on politics, that that will, will, will receive uh, much support among the public at large. Yeah, though I've I've been lately I've been uh, I've been going down the path of I don't believe democracy is power to the people very much. So um, yeah. there's there's the I can't remember who said this, but it was one of the founding fathers of the United States uh, who said that uh, that um, democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting for, voting on what's for dinner. And and uh, I think that describes democracy very well. Though though I mean the other half of the sentence is, is also not something I'd want to get into. That's the that's the liberty is a very well armed sheep. I don't think that's what we need. But we need protections of minorities. I think I think that's uh, that's the important point there. So um, so yeah. All right. So 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 how should we do this? Should we run through the hypotheses or you want to give like a general overview of what you actually tested and, and, and what you found? How should we do this? I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you do this. So take over. Okay. 
Maybe I can just uh, describe, let's say, the core argument of the paper, what we try mm -hmm. to to do in that paper, and 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 then a little bit reflect on on on, on the main findings. Eh? So, when we started thinking about um, that demand side, and and then you start thinking about who will support populism, because that's the main question that we address in 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 this paper. Then. We went back to the literature on um, on actually on voting for radical right and and radical left uh, wing wing parties, and there you find a lot of authors that that say, well, maybe the rise of populism is a reaction to let's say the the fast and disturbing change, cha changes that have been taking place due to globalization, mediatization of politics, and detraditionalization. Eh? And in these early accounts, populism as an attitude, although it was not measured, but it was discussed in, in that way, uh, was represented as typical for people who suffer from being confronted with, um, with, with, with the overwhelming change, uh, who have been placed in a weak and a vulnerable economic position uh, because of these uh, changes. Eh? So, there was a lot of literature that referred to the relevance of, let's say, personal vulnerability, actually. Yeah? But then we, we knew from, from other parts in the literature on voting behavior that the link between, let's say, the personal situation and, and, and political cha choices is, is not as straightforward as, as often represented. Yeah? In the literature, you sometimes find a distinction between what people call egocentric motives, uh, motives that relate to people's personal life situation, uh, uh, motives that directly related to their economic position or to their satisfaction with, with life. And on the, on the other hand, uh, people talk about sociotropic considerations that are considerations that refer to people's assessment of how society is doing, how it's evolving, uh, how, it, how it's likely to, to, to evolve. Eh? Um, and we know from the literature on voting behavior that these sociotropic considerations are much more important than these more egocentric uh, uh, um, uh, uh, motives, actually. So the main hypothesis we behind the whole paper is that these indicators of personal vulnerability, economic vulnerability, low uh, life satisfaction, that they in itself will not immediately translate into populism, eh? that they will only do so when they lead to a kind of interpretation of uh, people's personal vulnerability that relates that vulnerability to a view um, of, of a just society, actually, eh? and, and to a, a specific view on how society is, 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 is doing. Eh? And in the paper, we, we focus on two such stories or two such interpretations. Eh? First of all, there are the, the, the feelings of collective relative deprivation, and, and these are feelings that have been described at length, eh? that, that are feelings that explain one's personal vulnerability and weak position as a consequence of an injustice, eh? uh, as a form of discrimination against people like us who, who in this society never gets what they deserve. Eh? Uh, so we thought, well, feelings of relative deprivation will be important because they also fits nicely with that idea that one of the appealing characteristics of populism is that it has a high capacity for defining enemies. Eh? So there is a close fit between these feelings of collective uh, relative deprivation on the one hand and, and, and that uh, friend or foo uh, element that, that, that is clearly present uh, in, in, in populism. And then we had a more uh, a second, yeah, let's say discursive element or, or a part of a story. And that's that idea of of declinism, eh? that, that idea that society as a whole is in, in, in decline. And I want to stress that as a whole, eh? because if you look to the measure that we, um, um, that we use to, to measure declinism, you see that we deliberately aimed for a measure that tapped into a kind of holistic view on, on society. Yes? It has five sub-dimensions, it has uh, quite a lot of items to, to measure it, 
And when you look to these items, the only binding element between these subscales and between the underlying items is, is the idea of a general decline of society. Eh? I won't, would even go further. If you look at these items and if you would translate them to, let's say, issue positions eh, where you would actually say, well, we are in favor or we are against a, a certain type of, of measure that should be taken in, in, in that uh, context, eh, for example, environment and you would not find positive correlated subdimensions. Eh? The, the, the fact that they do correlate positively is because they all refer to a general decline of society. Eh? And that is exactly what we try to, to, to capture with that declinism factor, eh? a, a generalized feeling um, that, is, that is more a feeling than, than, than a concrete idea. And, and that element, of course, aligns very good with that heartland uh, idea that we borrowed from um, uh, uh, from from Paul Taggart uh, which actually also hints at the idea that one of the crucial elements in populism is that it's able to unite very different grievances and if you look from 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 these arguments to to the findings then first you find indeed that feelings of relative deprivation and declinism uh, very strongly predict uh, populist attitudes. I think that the final model, for example, explains about 50% of the total variance. Eh? So it's very clear that people will feel that they belong to a group that does not get what it deserves, or people will feel that society is in decline, that they strongly support populism. Eh? So, so that's clear. We also find that there is no direct relationship between people's economic position, people's life satisfaction and the support for populism. Uh, what we actually find is that the effect of these more egocentric uh, motivation is, is fully mediated by the decline in this measure and the relative deprivation measure. So this means that personal vulnerability uh, economic vulnerability, low satisfaction of, of, of life, that they are irrelevant for populists. Eh? In fact, they are relevant because they lead people to certain kind of discourses, to, to uh, feelings of relative deprivation and to uh, 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 declines. But there's no direct uh, effect, actually. One finding that goes against our expectation is that we do not find the direct effect of anomie. Eh? Uh, anomie is a concept that is that is not used that much in, in political science, uh, but it's often used in theories about modernization processes. Eh? It refers to, um, to, to the idea that due to uh, important changes in society, that, that some people feel that they lose track of, of, of these changes, eh? that they are not able to deal with these changes. Eh? Uh, it can be measured with items like everything becomes so complex that I no longer know what to do. I don't understand what is happening in the world. We thought that that would also be positively related to support for populism, but apparently that, that was not the case once you control for uh, feelings of relative deprivation and, 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 and declinism. Um, one finding, that is often overlooked in, in, in this paper, um, and that I find personally also very interesting, is that there actually remains a direct relationship between education and the support for populism. Huh? Uh, something which is, is, is not present for, for satisfaction with life or for people's economic position. Huh? Um, and we do not mention that in the discussion part, but that's due to the work limit, huh? um, because, um, that observation, uh, you, you can see that the total effect of education is actually less important than the total effect of people's economic position. But whereas the, the effect of people's economic position is fully mediated by our sociotropic motives, you find a quite strong direct effect from education directly on, on, on populist uh, uh, scores. And well, actually, that observation was for me the starting point to, to focus more strongly on the relevant of what we call education-based status. Eh? We believe they are 
uh, two reasons why the less educated support populists more than the higher educated. Uh, first, there is that indirect pot, but that's not very strong via uh, declinism and, and feelings of relative deprivation. But the si besides the indirect pot, there's also a more direct effect that, that um, refers, in our opinion, to education-based stigma consciousness. In the society where education is such a central institution, the categories less and higher educated carries social status or, or social stigma, which may be a reason to reject or embrace uh, uh, populism. And that's an element that we have developed in, in, in later uh, uh, papers. So I think that these were the main, the main observations uh, in, in, in this paper. It's brilliant. Uh... You know, it's it's really funny because, uh, like, when I when I signed this paper to my students, I signed it under the label of of uh, the political psychology of, <laughs> of of populism. And you know, I mean, this this is this is one of my favorite papers ever in in populism world. But we never got to talk about it. And and hearing you talk about it coming from such a sociological point of view, where I think this was like. At the forefront of psychology, it's is is really interesting because it really nicely intersects all those areas. I I I I don't know. I mean, this paper is well cited, but but I almost feel like uh, it it should should get even even more respect. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we wanted to do was to, in a way, connect long term social evolutions. Uh, which are typically studied by uh, sociologists with, uh, yeah, like you say, political or social psychological insights uh, into what attitudes do and what function they may fulfill. And I think that you need that connection to understand the demand side of, 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 of populism. Uh, um, um, I, I think you have to, to, to combine bo both literatures. Yeah, I was just talking to Hans Georg Betts, uh, um, hoping to record something similar conversation with him soon uh, about a paper that's even older than this, much older, um, on on um, on resentment, and yeah. uh, and he he said even today resentment is very important, and he specifically mentioned nostalgia as one of the key factors. So it's like what you saw ten years ago is is on people's mind. I was talking to Jennifer McCoy; she's very very interested about uh, uh, the emotions uh, underlying. So this this is going to be a theme, I think, in the in the coming years of populism research. And uh, and you saw it much much before um, most people. Let me let me hit this quote uh, that uh, that I that I really enjoyed in this paper. Uh, you say that paradoxically, populism appears as a politics of hope, desperate politics of hope, where the elite have failed the ordinary folk, uh, where the elites have failed the ordinary folk, common sense, and the politicians who give them voice can find solutions, halt the decline. Return to the heartland, to society that is, um, you know, nostalgic and romanticized. Re uh, retrospect seems good and just. So I, I was just, I was just uh, reading uh, um, um, Kathy Kramer, Kathy Kramer's book. Uh, I was uh, reading Ho Child's book, uh, which are ethnographic studies from parts of the US that would be described as heartland going back to, to, to that term. And this is exactly what those books elaborate on in hundreds of pages. And you really nailed it with the survey study. So uh, you, wanna, you wanna say a few more things about this maybe? Yeah, for us, that, that politics of hope argument is also related to that heartland uh, uh, element eh? where, where we very, and, and, and actually the credit goes to, to what we have read in, in, in uh, Paul Taggart's book, where he said, you should understand that populism in itself provides people with a, a horizon with 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 a, a view on what they are striving for and that is one of the reasons why it is so uh, uh, appealing eh? and and the reason why we call it a politics of hope is also because we 
find that that combination of on the one hand that very strong sense of declinism yeah, that people say well our, our our society as a whole is 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 is, is doing bad is 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 uh, things are declining uh, on on a broad range of uh, of, of topics and that they subsequently uh, combine it with uh, with strongly populist uh, views and the last couple of years i've asked uh, i've been asked uh, many many times what is for you the difference between feelings of lack of external political efficacy and populist attitudes and and i know that there are scholars who are very skeptical about the distinction between both because some people say well it, it's so much correlated between uh, the, the correlation between both is is is, is so uh, strongly is there really a difference and i would say well uh, first of all to some extent that's a kind of empirical question uh, um, I, I can talk about that but from a theoretical point of view i would say that the people centrism element is here the crucial difference uh, it's it's the the people centrism component in populism which actually renders populism a politics of hope eh? it's it's by 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 also presenting an alternative way of knowing an alternative way of of uh, of reasoning eh? for example and that's that may differ from country to country but in 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 the region that i study the belgium case and even more the, the flemish case um populist uh parties and populist politicians um, are on a continuous basis opposing different way of knowing eh? you you have the elitist way of knowing uh, the, the 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 schooled way of knowing and then you have common sense eh? uh, from people who have studied at the university of life and they they know how uh, uh, the world really works eh? well what populism does is that way of knowing that way of looking at society presenting as the only way of 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 leading your society to to a good a good future eh? so and that renders it it's it's a pop uh, politics of hope eh? i always say for me populism is not only against something it's also for something it's not only against the established elite it's also for the people for their way of approaching social problems their way of thinking and and that gives it a potential for change and of course it in many ways it, it's a desperate hope eh? uh, you see that uh, people who vote for populists uh, are often or in most cases simply betrayed by the populist it's, it, itself eh? but that does not mean that 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 the, the 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 main let's say motivation and the main uh, emotion which is 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 playing uh, behind uh, populist attitudes is not directed to to to, to change. Yeah. All right. So um, I I think we I think we uh, we we can put this paper to rest. But I mean, as you said, this paper is old, and you have. Uh, you have uh, you have worked on many related things since. Uh, so you yeah. want to mention a few things that maybe you're working on now, or you have worked in between this paper and now that builds on this, and maybe just a couple highlights. Yeah, the, there are actually two things that I want to mention here. Uh, first of all, um, from this paper onwards, uh, I started working more on the identity argument uh, in it, eh, which is here a little bit latent, eh, for example, that education effect, and especially the difference between education and, and people's economic position that was not discussed in much detail uh, in, 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 in this paper. But um, I, I, I did some work in, in later work, eh? for example, in an, in an Acta Politica paper that I published in, in, in 2014 also, I tried to show that measures for education-based group identity and perceived educational conflict are in a theoretically consistent way related to the support for populism, whereas that is not the case for feelings of lack of inter external political efficacy. So you can show that 
people will say, well, the higher educated have too much to say in society and they lead uh, society, uh, society in a wrong direction. Um, uh, that they tend to support populism even more and that people will say, well, the less educated have too much to say, uh, they lead society in the wrong direction, actually reject uh, 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 populism. And, and you, you find a very clear pattern there and you find it only for the support for populism. You find it not when you use uh, feelings of, of, of lack of external political uh, efficacy as, uh, as a dependent variable. And a similar observation was, was also central in a paper that we published later in, in Political Research Quarterly, where we showed that even after controlling for feelings of, of, of lack of external political efficacy, education not only remains associated with the support for populism, but is also its effect is also moderated by education-based identity. So in general, the, the less educated support populism more than, than, than the higher educated. That is a finding which is observed many, many times. But we showed that that educational differences, a difference in, in support for populism is larger when those people are, when people are aware of their educational position and, and even identify that. And then you see that less educated who identified with being less educated support populism even more strongly whereas the higher educated when they identified with uh, identify with being higher educated actually reject populism even even more eh? so that identity element uh, is, is 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 one thing i've been working uh, on and for which i'm i'm quite happy that in in different uh, versions and with different designs it it, it tends to replicate uh, at least in, 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 in the Flanders uh, 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 case, actually. Um, I, I mean, and, and I mean, I, I know most of the studies from the US, it's fully in line with the anthropological <laughs> research yeah. that, that's been done on this in the US. Yeah. So. But in the US- Well, very the, cool. Yeah, the, in, in the US, the, the, the situation is a little bit complicated in the sense that, for example, in Flanders, there are no important differences in the prestige of institutions. Eh? Uh, we have different university and they are mostly similar in terms of, of, of uh, social prestige. And, and of course, in, in, in the US, you have great differences between uh, uh, different institutions. So I, I think that there, uh, the situation may be a little bit more uh, 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 complicated. And then maybe if, 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 I, if we have still time, um, Absolutely. A, sec a, sec a second topic that interests me uh, very, very much is um, th that idea or, or yeah, it, it's research that actually focuses on how um, populist attitudes combine with, with, with other attitudes. Uh, um, and I think that that is important because studying these interrelationships between populism and other additional elements, that is something we, we kind of lost along the way. Eh? Um, if you look back to the early measurement papers, eh, and, and I refer to the 2012 paper of Kirk Hawkins, Scott Riding, and Cas Mudde, and the 2014 CPS paper of uh, Agnes Ackerman, Andrei Zaslov, and, and Cas Mudde, they defined populism and populist attitudes uh, by not only saying what it is, but also by saying and by trying to measure what it is not, eh? by, by trying to measure the, the opposing attitudes. And the fascinating thing, if you look back to both studies, is that when you look um, at the empirical results, they actually arrive at a regular basis at findings which to some extent contradict their original expectations. Eh? For example, they, they have to drop certain items, they find a positive correlation where they're expected uh, uh, to find the negative one, etc. Et and of course, all this is, is part of, of, let's say, the, the normal development of a measure. And at the same time, for me, these observations of these inconsistent findings I think that they deserve 
much more attention and much more theorizing than they have received so far, um, especially because they continue to pop up. Eh? Last year, there was a great study published in American Pop uh, um, Political Science Review where uh, Bertsu and Karamani studied the relationship between populism and technocratic attitudes. And they actually performed a latent class analysis. They found six uh, classes. Three of them could be interpreted in a theoretical meaningful way. They fitted with, with the theory they had about the relationship between uh, populism and, and technocratic future, uh, um, uh, views. But at the same time, there were also three classes comprising about half of the sample, okay? so a, a considerable part of the respondents, in which respondents made combinations between these attitudes that were extremely hard to interpret. And what this all shows for me is that there's, in a way, much to gain from not, uh, for, from, from not studying populist attitudes in isolation. I think that we should try to relate them as much as possible to other additional elements and study whether these relationships vary by third variables like education or, or, or something else. And so I think that approaching populism from um, a more uh, belief system approach where you actually try to map uh, core elements of, 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 of the, the views that people have on, 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 on uh, society uh, is, is one fruitful way to further advance uh, uh, this literature on the demand side. Eh? Uh, I, I think that we have traveled a long way. Eh? Just 10 years ago, there were not even uh, scales uh, for, for measuring populist at, uh, uh, attitudes. And now we have multiple scales. We have excellent papers who assess these um, uh, scale properties. We have a lot of correlation studies. You see that um, we have uh, implemented um, uh, populist attitudes in experimental design. So I think there's great achievements uh, in, in, in that literature. Uh, on, on the demand side. And I think that an interesting next step would be to approach it populism more from, from let's say, uh, a belief system uh, uh, approach where you simultaneously look to multiple attitudes uh, or multiple additional uh, uh, elements. Yeah. And of course, this is incredibly difficult because uh, uh, I... I bring this up often that uh, that if your party system has a left-wing populist party as opposed to a right-wing populist party, then the belief systems will be completely different. Like, uh, yeah, of course, how it's course. related to nativism is the obvious one. It relates very differently in in, yeah. in Greece with Syriza yeah. than yeah. it than it relates uh, in 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 um, I don't know in pick me in Hungary, uh, but. Uh, and that's but, also a next step, yeah. I would say, that we should take. Eh? So we are now developing a literature focusing on the demand side, partially as a reaction to that overwhelming supply side literature. But of course, if we truly want to understand a phenomenon like populism, we should combine them and, and to, 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 to see how the demands and the supply fit to each other and how that works. Uh, um, so, so, so there's enough work to do, I would say. Yeah, yeah, we definitely won't uh, won't be done with this anytime soon. So, well, thank you so much, uh, Bram, for for joining You're us uh, and having this conversation. Okay. You're welcome, and success with the rest of the of the of the series. Eh? <laughs> so well, we'll do. We'll do. Bye, everyone. Bye.